Welcome to the third part of three-part series of my interview of Tani Kantio Sakawue, former Chief Justice of California Supreme Court and current President of the Public Policy Institute of California. In today's part three, we will talk about election reform, federalism, and democracy. Earlier in part one, we talked about Tani's journey, lessons learned, and insights. Afterwards, in part two, Tani answered questions about California's economy and the future. Disclaimer, I take a complete nonpartisan approach to judicial and election related issues. All my questions here are issue based, not through the lens of politics or political partisanship, even though I regard myself as a centrist Democrat. Welcome back, uh, Tani. Thank you so much. Now, rank choice voting. It has been advocated by some very intelligent Harvard professors and political consultants. Ranked choice voting is already used in some gubernatorial and mayoral elections. Can it be used in primaries for presidential election? As advocated in a book, The Politics Industry, How Political Innovation Can Break Partisan Gridlock and Save Our Democracy by Catherine Gall and Michael Porter, Harvard Business School professor. Hi, Joanne. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with you again. I think ranked voting is is has a lot of pros to it. I think the greatest issue with ranked voting is people do not understand it entirely. And there's a whole strategy behind how uh, candidates will position themselves and advertise and campaign around ranked, strat ranked voting. And I think that we need to understand that. That has to be something that most voters, all voters understand before they cast their vote and rank their uh, votes in a ranked uh, voting election. But I also think that while you think and talk about expanding it to a gubernatorial or higher level of office, I would I don't know this, I've not looked at it, but I'm guessing that there are probably certain enabling pieces of legislation that have to be enacted by our legislature or by different states legislature, even by our Congress to permit it to happen. And what I also worry about ranked voting is I think it can be complicated and it is strategic. And I would hate to see something like ranked voting cause voters to decide not to participate because they don't understand it, because uh, they think that they're being, uh, there is some campaign and strategy around it. We want to encourage more voters, so we shouldn't make it more complicated for them to vote. And I wouldn't want them manipulated in their vote either. That makes sense. Um, okay, so ranked choice voting is giving each voter more choices. It's like among these candidates, they can be Democrats, Republicans, independents. You rank which one is your top choice? Let's say there are five. Top choice number one, the last choice number five. And if no candidates get 50%, then the next candidate will be calculated on the basis of the ranking by all the voters. So in this way, the effect is that we don't have to be limited to just one party or the other party. So the so all the vitriol, the partisanship of the two party adversarial, uh, it's not adversarial, but two party, this kind of a, in my opinion, is just collapsing onto itself and not going anywhere for the past 30 plus years uh, is avoided. So we can have a governing, functioning government. We can educate voters about this. And in other states, governors have already been elected based on ranked choice voting. Mayors have already been elected based on ranked choice voting. So, so people there, they could understand it. And I'm sure most of the voters, if they spend a little time and with simplified education, they can understand the system. I really believe this is a very good and fair device. It gives people more choices and the results are not two-party partisanship. 
Okay, it avoids the evil of that. So uh, the other question is term limits for US Supreme Court justices. Stanford professor Larry Diamond and other highly respected voices recommend term limit for SCOTUS, which is gaining traction in the US. Some suggested the term limit to be at age 75 or three terms of six years. And the fourth term is up to six years. Stanford professor Larry Diamond in his book, Ill Wins suggested limiting every SCOTUS's term to 18 years. What do you think? Well, I, I have heard of the one and done, one term and done uh, idea of a judicial office. And at the same time, I will say I'm open to it. I think that well vetted and discussed, I don't see it necessarily in and of itself, that idea as a problem. Other states already have a what we call the constitutional senility rule. We sort of joke about it. So you turn 70. If you're a Supreme Court justice, I think in New York, you're out. No thing beyond 70 years of age. And I think that's true in Florida as well. And so I think I am I am neither a proponent or an opponent of it, but I have to think that any solution has to be a realistic one in terms of being accomplished. And I believe that if you start talking about a constitutional amendment, if that's, I believe that may be required for purposes of changing the lifetime appointments of the federal judgeship at the United States Supreme Court level, that would be very difficult just politically to get on uh, on people, on states, to get states to call constitutional amendments to ratify that uh, change. Because if that's the case, if you're looking to, to term limit uh, United States Supreme Court justices, then it raises the question of why don't we term limit circuit court judges and district court judges in the federal system, because they're also unlimited. And then why sh wouldn't we also, if we're, why pick on one branch? Why don't we also term limit Congress? Let's term limit House representatives terms and let's term limit senators as well because the gridlock is primarily in the executive and the congressional branch. The judicial branch has no, they don't have gridlock. In fact, with only nine people, they move pretty fleetly, even if not in, in popular opinion. So if you're going to talk a constitutional amendment for a one and done kind of term, it raises the question of shouldn't we do this for all federal office at that level? And I think that's an important policy question that, that should be looked at. I, I don't think it's wrong in and of itself. It's one of those ideas that should be vetted. Um, and I think you do need the input of the other branches because there are times when presidents kind of get the opportunity to really appoint to vacancies and form the court. It just, and, and that seemed to have happened under Donald Trump. It hasn't happened under a Democratic president, I think, and well, Jimmy Carter comes to mind. He had, I think Carter had certainly number of uh, federal appointments, at least at the uh, circuit court level where he was able to form courts philosophically. But it, it's certainly open to consideration. But if it is, it shouldn't just be reserved for the judiciary. Yeah. I have no problem uh, having term limits for all branches, you know, mm -hmm. at different levels. Now, ethic rules for SCOTUSes, in light of the revelation about accepting lavish gifts by U.S. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas for decades, do you think Congress needs to make enforceable ethic rules will hold SCOTUSes responsible since no one is above the law? If any of the SCOTUSes violate them, who would enforce the rules and uh, what would be the punishment? Yes, yeah, so I think it's an interesting legal question. It's an interesting constitutional question. It's a really critical ethics question. I think I join the rest of the world and country in thinking that certainly a, a enforceable ethics uh, uh, ethics rules should be in place for the United States Supreme Court uh, justices. 
as it is for the United States Supreme Court appellate justices and United States Supreme Court trial court justices, and that there hasn't been an enforceable uh, rule set is troubling, and it would go a long way toward helping ensure public trust and confidence in the justice system, particularly at its highest level, the United States Supreme Court. And in California, for example, we don't have lifetime appointments for Supreme Court justices, but we do have 12 year term as you run every 12 years and you run unopposed. Um, but at the same time, we have a separate independent commission called the Commission on Judicial Performance. And we as Supreme Court justices have rules of ethics, canons and rules that we must abide. If we violate them because someone reports us, you can go before the commission and the commission is empowered to remove the jurist from office. And the commission is made up of mostly civilians, non-lawyers, non-judges, appointed by, and these are public members, appointed by the other two branches of government. So when I was the chief justice, I had two or three appointments to the commission on judicial performance, but the legislature and the executive branch had more appointments than I did. And they appointed civilians who had oversight over judges. And that, that works in California. There is no such body that I know of for the United States Supreme Court, but I think it would go a long way to actually have enforceable rules. Because as you point out, what people remember about the United States Supreme Court is Justice Thomas's big yacht trips and gifts and real estate while he was on the bench hearing cases. And he, he, he states that that did not influence any of his decisions. But remember, conf ethics rules are built on two, two pieces of two, two tenets, that there is a conflict or there is the appearance of conflict. So even if I can tell you that there's no conflict for me hearing my, my good friend's lawsuit, I'm st I should still be recused ethically because even if I could be, there is the appearance that there could be conflict, which gives people doubt in the trust of the law. So whether Congress does it or not, I think is a legal issue. I don't know that Congress has that legal authority to set rules of that nature for uh, the United States Supreme Court lifetime, uh, federally appointed, presidential appointed, Senate confirmed uh, officers of the United States. I haven't looked into that. I'm sure they have, they must think they have it, but that's pretty uh, drastic when another branch reaches out against the other branch's wishes and enforces and sets out rules of enforcement. Um, when I would, when I was the chief justice and I heard that the legislature was thinking of regulating the judiciary in some way like this, I would call them up. I'd call up the leaders of the legislature or the governor's office and say, wait, 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 no, don't do this. We will craft our own rule. And then if you don't like it, you can try to override it. So I, I don't know about this uh, Congress stepping in, telling the judges, what they can and cannot do. And if they do step in and tell the judges what they can and cannot do at that level, then I hope that Congress also lives up to those same rules. Yes. And if not Congress, you expect either the court itself, hopefully the Chief Justice Roberts will take that initiative and come up with something that is enforceable or the people of the United States, they, from all states, they have to come up with a constitutional amendment, which is a monumental. Now, next question regarding the principles of federalism, state power, and our republic. This may be a loaded question, but I think we all want to hear from your perspective. The United States was founded on the principle of a republic consisting of independent states where federal laws and state laws are independent and separate. This question is not meant to be political. I know that your political party affiliation is independent and I respect that. I'd like to use the current conviction of former President Donald Trump by New York State Court to learn about federal court limitations and potential overreach. Assuming this scenario, and this is related to federalism and checks and balances. If 
the U.S. Supreme Court rules that a sitting president has absolute immunity, which sounds like the power of a king to me, and further rules that the New York conviction must be retried, vacated, or even overruled on the ground that the falsification of business records under New York law is related to the federal election, even though the illegal act related to federal election deprived citizens their right to be informed, which is a federal crime, will the federal absolute immunity override New York state law under the supremacy clause since Trump wrote the check to reimburse the hush money after inauguration, presumably under absolute immunity protection? If this is a loaded question, so yeah, let me read the questions. If the US Supreme Court indeed rules as such, what are the ramifications in your opinion for our foundational principles of independent state and federal jurisdiction? Will that be an overreach by the federal judicial branch? And then second question, what harm would absolute immunity do to the checks and balances of our government? And third, same scenario, same questions, but with limited immunity instead of absolute immunity. I'm sorry, but I can give you one piece at a time. So the first is, what, what is the rep, if it's ruled as such, which I doubt, but who knows, okay? What are the ramifications for the foundational principle of independent state and federal jurisdiction? Would that be the over, an overreach by the federal judicial branch? Well, let me say to this, what's today? Today's the 24th. Yes, Monday. We, don't, we only have to wait six more days and the United States Supreme Court is going to answer that question for us, right? Their term ends June 30th, I believe. So they're going to have to, for every case argued this term, they're going to have to rule. So they're going to rule. If um, they do find absolute immunity from all criminal actions by a sitting president. I can't imagine like you, but it will have ramifications and consequences and they won't be, I, I, I wanna say that, it, I, I don't know how they, it would be how they, they write it. Those are, they're very, all nine are very learned scholars and experienced. And in addition, as you know, they all hire top-notch uh, law student interns who help them with the research. And then the lawyers who argued this case on both sides were teams of lawyers with amicus briefs and every legal stone was unt unturned. And even a parade of horribles was probably listed for the court when in the briefing. And the ramifications as will be long lasting and long affecting. And I don't think it will be just to independent, the independence of state and federal judiciaries. The truth is, as you know, when the United States Supreme Court rules on a matter that is potentially Take, that is a constitutional right arising from the US Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the other, what, 17 amendments that uh, occurred after the first 10, then they are the last and final word. They are the highest court of this state on a constitutional issue. And therefore they speak last and they are, whether you think they're right or wrong, they are and have full authority in that area. So I think that however they rule, it will, I know it will be the law of the land. And they're aware of that. And they're aware of these ramifications and these considerations. That's why the opinion will be really interesting to read if they find absolute immunity. Um, as you know, it could be something far less than absolute immunity. And we'll have to read how much less. But I, I believe this, the United States Supreme Court whether you like them or not, agree with them or not, they have been, in their opinions, very frank and very transparent. They write out what the issue is, what the law is, and why and how they concluded the way they did. 
that gives us all an opportunity to read it, to disagree, or to agree with some pieces. But one thing is certain, they do their work, maybe apart from the allegations against Justice Thomas and sitting on cases where his friends had an interest. For the most part, the United States Supreme Court has historically been transparent. They, and they, they write out their decisions, you can attend the hearings, and they are, um, nine people serve as a check and balance on each other. If one of the justices says something that the other disagrees with, you know it, they write it, they tell you why. So I wanna say that I think the process, even though how much we disagree with it, how much people seem to have strong opinions about Supreme Court decisions, the process is unlike any process of governance in the United States or elsewhere. Courts are transparent. We write what we think and allow everybody to take a shot at it. And typically we're working off of old laws that we're trying to apply to new and weird everyday contemporary situations. So I don't know that it will do damage to the independence of a, between the state and federal judiciary because there's a lot of interconnection. They are not independent. It's true, we have a state constitution and there is a federal constitution, but as you pointed out, the federal constitution on issues of common, common issues is supreme. It does rule. We do have a central government. That was the big fight uh, after we won the war against Britain is we are going to have a central government. Um, the other piece about um, um, the overreach, you know, I think overreach is in the eye of the beholder. And it's sort of like the word activist judge is in the eye of the beholder. Some will say it's an activist judge because they lost. Some will say the judge was absolutely uh, um, uh, wise because they won. It, I, I can't speak to uh, how a decision that hasn't been made would affect us because I don't know what nine people, nine brilliant people will actually say about the law. I'd like to read it. I know we're all watching it. Mm -hmm. um, it was a state law. It does affect potentially the state prosecution of those 34 felonies. Um, so it will, uh, I think we just have to wait six more days. Ah, yes. Well, in my humble opinion, uh, it's unlikely, no matter how extreme their partisanship is, they, they all they all belong to one party or the other, to have absolute immunity. Uh, because that will be, uh, the last straw will break the camel's back because that means we are no longer a democracy ruled by law. That's for kings, okay, absolute immunity. The check and balance of the three branches of government. It very much looks like the Supreme Court has a final say about elections. Um, I don't know how long it's going to take us until the January 6th reaches the Supreme Court. It happened in Gore versus Bush. And so practically, the Supreme Court is more powerful than the other two branches of the government, even though it shouldn't be. Well, I think that's a matter of opinion. What we're seeing, what I would take, say with your last comment, that it appears that the Supreme Court is more powerful than the other two branches. I think that in part, it's because it's perceived that way because the Supreme Court acts and interprets and continues to publish and opinions and decisions. You, there's not gridlock at the United States Supreme Court. They are a true, thorough, working branch of government. They're not bound by politics. They have, uh, they don't have any, they're not paralyzed. They don't, they decide. And it may be in part because there's nine of them versus 500 and plus in the house and, 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 and how many hundred plus in the Senate side. It's, um, they, are, they are not, politicians, except I know people perceive that because they are the highest court and they do manage to set policy. But, you know, just because the other two branches of government haven't been 
as active and effective and efficient, say on immigration, uh, protective rights, voting rights, and the United States Supreme Court has been, doesn't mean that it's more powerful. I think we have to look at what's wrong. Why are the other two branches of government not stepping up and working together? Immigration has been an issue in for as long as I can think of in my conscious adult years, and we've never had a solution to it. But the solution actually seems rather political, not not unrealistic, and and not and that there are compromises to be made. But we're but we haven't seen any change. There's been no clarification in policy. I, and I'm not saying this to point fingers, but there are so many people in those other two branches of government and they are, don't seem to be getting to all the work that needs to be done in the United States. And then you have the nine member United States Supreme Court who by the constitution are to do what they do, decide cases and controversies that come before them. There's nine of them and they do. And it just happens to be that this nine has a supermajority of six people who typically are considered conservative. And that is reflected in their in their in their decisions and rulings and opinions. So I don't know that we point the finger at the United States Supreme Court if we just don't look at our entire three branches of government and find out where things aren't working. Yes. You know, the United States Supreme Court government, United States Supreme Court gets those cases because they're controversies. And they go up through the system. They go through the uh, district court, the trial court level, then they go up to the circuit court, the appellate court level, and then they come to the United States Supreme Court. And typically, these are the same issue as happening in multiple states. The United States Supreme Court is required to opine and issue a decision on this point. That is their duty and their job. They cannot put off a problem and call it political like the other branches. They have to do this work. Yeah. And they are. And and I think that we don't always agree and we're critical of them. And that's part of the job and part of the territory. But we also see that they actually write out their opinions. So instead of criticizing them, I would read the opinion and then decide what parts I disagree with. But they are transparent about what they're thinking and how they rule. And fair process is as important as the decision itself, I think. Yes, fair process is as important. That's the the envy of the world that we have this rule of law and we have the system, we have the institution and hopefully the respect for the institution. That leads to the last question about civility, the prerequisite for democracy. The vitriol, the hatred, the partisanship, the mutual blaming, all of these are eating America up from inside. What do you think each citizen should do to restore civility, the respect for the institutions, for the offices, the public offices, for healthy debates and save our democracy? Well, that's a big question. And all big questions start with answers that start small. All big problems have to start at the root. You don't take out a big problem at the head of the problem. You start at the root and you work your way through and up so that the big problem doesn't grow anymore and can't be replicated someplace else. I think that we as residents of this state and this country, we need to model civility. We need to be more, uh, 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 I think, respectful of differences of opinion with people. We need to understand that we're all in this together and all of us have challenges and issues and sometimes all of us are not at our best. And so I think we have a duty first and foremost to be more forgiving of our neighbor, more understanding of our neighbor, more uh, understanding of the work of public servants. That includes the people who pick up our garbage to the people working at McDonald's to the people who are uh, policing our streets. We have to be people who can model it and expect it in our representatives. And then we need to put our vote where it counts to with and to and for people of integrity and people of character and people who have demonstrated that and modeled it their entire lives, not just in an ad, not just in a glossy, not just in a very convenient selfie or self aggrandizing video. We need to be more selective as people about who in our republic we elect to represent us. 
I mean, that's the, the beauty of a, repu a democratic, repu a republic democracy. We elect people to represent us. If our politicians are slurring each other, they represent us doing that. And it also, as you have pointed out time and again here, we gain nothing from that except viral tweets of, of passing uh, kind of shameful entertainment. I, I do not like it when I hear, and I'll just say this, when I hear, for example, the president of the United States um, uh, deriding the United States Supreme Court for its decisions. It's one thing to say, I disagree. I would have done it differently. I'm disappointed. But to otherwise insult them, and, and that's not just true of this president. It's true of former presidents. Trump was also in the same boat calling judges names about so-called judges and taking on legislators and pers on personal levels. All of that is distasteful, arrogant, inappropriate, and a waste of time. And we, as a people, shouldn't be reading it because we're feeding the beast by, by reading that and passing it on and clicking onto that. We should demand more of our elected leaders. Yes, and invoke the better angels inside ourselves. We, yeah. oh gosh, this is so wonderful. Thank you so much, Tani, for your invaluable insights, wisdom, and generosity in sharing about your journey and your thoughts about California and our country's future. With my heartfelt gratitude, as I am closing this three-part interview, on behalf of the audience around the world, we wish you the very best. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you for your insightful, wise questions. I've enjoyed our conversation.